Good evening, church family and any guests who are joining with us this evening. We want to welcome you to our online Christmas Eve gathering. Even saying that comes with a note of grief as we recognize that this means that in this present pandemic reality, we cannot celebrate this moment together in an embodied form. My name is Brianna and this is Andrew. We both serve on staff as part of the West Village team and we wanna thank all of you so much for joining us on this Christmas Eve like no other. We know for many of you, this will be a quieter Christmas than normal. It might even come with a measure of sadness or even mourning as family members are missed and traditions are lost. For all of us, 2020 has seemed like a year of disruption, and meeting exclusively online is just one more reminder of that. But on a dark night uh, 2,000 years ago, not unlike this December 24th, Jesus Christ, God the Son, entered into our pain and our brokenness, bringing hope to the hopeless, peace to the anxious, and love to the unlovable. That moment, too, was a moment of disruption. The God who had created the heavens and the earth stepped into history as a baby, disrupting the lives of everyone he had encountered. Our hope is that this gathering will tell a better story than the story many of us feel like we are living in. We want to acknowledge the pain and difficulty that has clouded the story of what 2020 has been like. But more than that, we want to be reminded of how Jesus gloriously disrupted our story and can completely change and redeem it. To help remind us of this glorious disruption, we've been taking a moment each Sunday leading up to this evening to light a candle in our Advent wreath as a reminder of what our true reality is in Jesus. Tonight, we light our final candle, traditionally called the Christ candle. And so as Brianna lights the final candle, I will let it be a reminder that Jesus is our source of hope, love, joy, and peace, no matter what is happening in the world around us. So please get comfortable, top up your cup of coffee or hot cocoa, cuddle up to those who you are with and prepare your hearts to joyfully celebrate as we are reminded of what Jesus has done for us. How should we describe this year? Painful, disappointing, lonely, relentless, disaster. A year of waiting for things to get better, anticipating something other than the monotony of case counts, working from home, and this unnamed, gnawing stress chewing on our souls. A text. A love note. Come home. A disruption from the beat, beat, beat of these thoughts pulling you back into the moment. This moment. A moment that doesn't feel like or look like it normally does, but has been anticipated since the memory of it was first rekindled by the Father repainting the trees in gold and red and amber. There's a growing anticipation, an excitement for events that appear rote and routine, yet are a renewing and welcome disruption of our broken reality and tedious rhythms. The feeling grows from darkness and nothing, but now warms us as its star has risen bright and we charge towards its inevitable, humble arrival. Entrance, homecoming, kisses, embrace. Connection, family, prayers and thanksgiving. A routine rehearsed over and over, yet tonight is thick with anticipation. Feasting. Sharing. Conversations. Celebration. Joy, laughter, disruption, because the routine of every evening is disturbed by the intrusion of history, present glad tidings, and future hope. Now we join the hands of our own households and extend our hearts to true family made by bonds set in spirit. Voices will be lifted, hope will soar. What a glorious disruption is coming was and evermore will be. Come, thou long 
expected Jesus. Come. Good evening, West Village family, and welcome to our online Christmas Eve gathering. We are so excited that you were able to join us tonight. And even though this year is so different than in the past, we are still excited to gather together to celebrate who Jesus is, what he's done, and his coming to us, moving into the neighborhood as a humble baby. So let us stand together. Let us sing praises to Jesus together. Sing together prophets promised long ago. Prophets promised long ago a king would come to bring us hope. And now a virgin bears a son, the time to save the world has come. Humble shepherds run in haste. Emmanuel. 
day he'll die to make us sons of God on high. Let every heart prepare him room. The promises have all come true. Sing Emmanuel. Emmanuel has come to us. The Christ is born.
Merry Christmas, West Village family. Merry Christmas. Now, when we think of Christmas, our minds are often filled with all these great memories, aren't they? Uh, one of my greatest memories from my Christmas growing up was this tradition that my family had. There was me and my mom and my brother. And what my mom would do is she would buy all the Christmas presents that as she was accumulating them and she would put them in the trunk of the car. And she had this rule with us that if we if we ever looked in the trunk, she would take all of our Christmas presents back. Uh, now, you probably don't know my mom, but she was a bit of a scary lady. So we believed her. So not once growing up did I ever look in the trunk of the car at any of my presents, not even one time. Uh, and then on Christmas Eve, what our family would do is we'd, we would watch The Sound of Music together, me, my mom, and my brother. And then once The Sound of Music was over, uh, my mom would send us to bed. She would go out to uh, the trunk. She'd bring in all the presents. She would wrap every single present on Christmas Eve, put them under the tree. And then the next morning, we would wake up and open our presents. Now, as me and my brother got older, we started to catch on to what she was doing. So she would send us to bed and we would pretend to sleep. And then we would wake up as soon as wake up as soon as she was done unwrapping the presents. I mean, I'm talking like four or five o'clock in the morning. We would wake up, come upstairs. My mom, being the nice lady that she was, she would let us uh, come upstairs and and we'd open our presents. And most Christmas mornings, we were done by like six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. I mean, as a kid, it was amazing. As a parent, you're probably thinking this is, you know, this is a terrible idea unless you have small kids and then you call that a typical Tuesday. But, but for most of us, Christmas is absolutely filled with wonderful memories, right? The fireplace is warm. There's decorations on the tree. There's Christmas lights. There's food. Oh my goodness, there's so much food. The food is unreal. You have to get the stretchy pants out because the food is so good. There's Christmas dinner. The kids are excited. They're wired. They're, they're looking forward to presents. There's family traditions. And there's so much about this time of the year that we all treasure so deeply. Uh, but this year, it just feels different, doesn't it? Uh, this year feels like it has all been snatched from us. Just about everything we love about this time of the year has been taken away. The family dinners are different. Shopping is different. Even Christmas Eve with our church family, it's, it's all different. And really, isn't that a giant metaphor for what this year has looked like, for what 2020 has looked like? Where everything we know, everything we are used to, the things that we love and we cherish feels like they're gone just like that, the snap of, of fingers. There's been a bunch of funny memes floating around about 2020. My kids have been showing me these memes. There's one of a, an image of a porta potty uh, and, and it says, and the porta potty's on fire and it says if 2020 was a scented candle, this is what it would look like. And then uh, there's a Christmas ornament that's been floating around and it's a, it's a garbage dumpster that's on fire. And, and again, it's like 2020 Christmas ornament has been a dumpster fire. And that about sums it up, doesn't it? It sums up what the year's like. But it's not really the whole story. There's this 19th century uh, Russian poet named Apollon Makoff. Now, now he was uh, an atheist, but he kind of flirted with these kind of Christian or at least existential ideas in his poetry. Uh, and he wrote this poem that it was entitled uh, From Apollodor the Gnostic. And it goes like this. I want you to hear these words. He writes, don't say that there is no escape and the trouble that troubles wear you out. The darker the night, the brighter the stars, the deeper the sorrow, the closer to God. And what he was getting at was this idea that when life is hard, when there is deep pain, when there's grief in our lives, that it's those moments where we have some of the most profound and deep spiritual experiences, uh, where we're in touch with our own emotions. And there's this certain level of sensitivity in our hearts that we're actually receptive and open to the voice of God. Because if we're honest, it feels like we have nowhere else to turn. C.S. Lewis, who's a great Christian thinker and theologian, has this famous line where, where he says something very similar he says that God whispers in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pains. In effect, what he's saying is that when life is hard, we're actually able to hear God. Now, I know that we love the sentimentalism that comes along with Christmas, but if there was ever a year to separate the Christmas story that so that is so often filled with sappy sentimentalism that, that kind of feels like this hallmark 
picturesque movie scene where everything gets wrapped up with a bow in the end and everyone is smiling and having dinner together and everything is perfect. This is definitely the year, isn't it? In John chapter one, uh, John, one of Jesus's closest disciples, gives us a picture of what Christmas is really all about. Uh, But he doesn't give it to us from the perspective that we're used to. Like he doesn't give us angels and shepherds and mangers. He actually pulls back the veil for us. He lets us peek behind the curtain, if you will, to see what is actually going on. And in John chapter one, verse 14, he says this. He says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy crazy. Uh, Now, there are three ideas here that John lays out for us that absolutely blow up our cultural, sentimental ideas of what Christmas is all about. Uh, And in a year like the one that we find ourselves in are more relevant than they have ever been. First, what John says is that God actually became a man. Uh, This is what he means when he says that the word became flesh. He's talking about Jesus when he uses the word word. Uh, And the Greek is the word logos. And that's where we get our word logic from. And it's this concept that you can take an idea that is out here somewhere and you can turn it into something tangible that you can actually understand, a concept that you can actually understand. Uh, If you think of the idea of a logo, this might make a little bit more sense. Uh, If you were to see a swoosh, what would you think of? You would think of Nike. Uh, If you were to see a set of golden arches, what would you think of? Well, probably first heartburn, Uh, but then after that, you would think of McDonald's. And what John is saying is that this baby Jesus, this eight pound, six ounce uh, baby Jesus isn't just a baby. This is actually God. This is the fullness of God that is dwelling in this baby. But he also says this. He says that he made his dwelling among us. Uh, Here, hear what John is doing is he's using an image that would have been very familiar to the first readers, pulls it right out of the Old Testament, where the nation of Israel would have had a, a temple, and in that temple was where the presence of God actually dwelt. He dwelt among his people. Uh, Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message translation of the Bible, uh, when he translates this verse, or when he rewrites this verse, he says that God actually moved into the neighborhood. Uh, And in the realm of philosophy and uh, theology, there are sort of these two ideas of how God works. Uh, One is deism. Deism is this idea that God is far away. He, He isn't relational in any way. That his only involvement in the world was helping it get started. That he sort of wound up the universe like a clock, started a timer, let it run, and now he's kind of taking a nap watching Netflix. He's sort of like an absentee landlord. He doesn't call. He doesn't check in. He doesn't really do anything. He only shows up when the rent is due. The other idea of how God works is this idea of theism, that God is personal, that he's relational, uh, that he's actually involved in the world, but he really still can't be known. But what John is telling us is something radically different than both of these ideas. He's saying that God actually enters into the system. It isn't that he's just involved. He actually enters into it. He becomes like one of us. Now, this is a uniquely Christian idea. One that God wants us to know that he wants to be known. uh, That he would be willing to go to these great lengths to actually make it happen. He would come from heaven to earth and enter into human history as a baby uniquely Christian idea. I mean, mean, just think with me for a second about every religious idea or thought in the marketplace of ideas. They're all about a God up in heaven who wants us to get up to him. But the Christmas story comes in and it blows up these categories. You see, what John is telling us is that that is not how God is. God doesn't look down at us and say, good luck, folks. Hope you can figure it out. He actually enters in comes to us. You see, 2020 is like a giant metaphor for the human condition. Uh, It's this idea that there's, there's something wrong with the world, that the way the world is currently constituted, it just, it just isn't working. 
But the world is just a massive projection of what is happening in here, inside our hearts. But the reason the world is a broken place is because you and I are broken. And there have classically been two ways that we've tried to answer that problem. On one hand, we have this idea of secular humanism or just the the classic West Coast spirituality that basically says, it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. And we just look ahead to something temporary to solve our problem. What's the hope right now? Right now, we're all holding out hope for a vaccination. Once we get a vaccination, then everything will be fine. But the problem is not everything is going to be okay. There's going to be another problem and another problem and another problem. And once this struggle is gone, another struggle will enter in. And so religion comes in and it says, well, listen, the world is a broken place. You're broken. The world's broken. And so what you need to do is you need to try really hard, work really hard to fix yourself. Uh, You have to look inside yourself to to, to make yourself right, to fix yourself up, to clean yourself up. A new age spirituality might say, that the power is within you. Other forms of religion will will tell you that you can somehow attain a level of piety or holiness that, that somehow we can actually fix what is wrong with us. But the Christmas story, what, what John is telling us here, well, he's saying a couple of things. He's saying you can't actually save yourself. That no amount of wishful thinking or Christmas cheer or even religious obedience can solve this problem. It's far too complex. It's too deep. It's too beyond our ability to solve because it's inside our heart. But the other thing that the Christmas story tells us, and it's beautiful, friends, it's so beautiful, it's that God doesn't leave us alone to figure it out by ourselves. He actually enters in. There's something glorious about what we're celebrating when we actually, when we actually celebrate Christmas. We're being honest with ourselves and with each other. We're admitting that we're broken. Uh, We're admitting that we have need, but, but at the same time, we are acknowledging that God, the God who made us, the God who knows us, the God who loves us, that same God has come in to save us. That is good news, isn't it? In a year like 2020, it's more than good. It's actually beautiful. And then John ends verse 14 like this. He says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. We have seen his glory. It's a curious line, isn't it? What does he mean? Well, let's just pull all this together. Uh, We have baby Jesus in the manger, the Christmas story, Uh, but we know that this is more than just a nice holiday story. We know that, that this is actually God coming to be with us, and John is saying that we have seen his glory. Now, this verse is at the very beginning of John's gospel, which is a biography of the life of Jesus. Uh, And John, as he's writing this, he already knows how Jesus's life is going to end. Uh, He knows that Jesus is going to go to the cross. He knows that he's going to die on the cross. And he knows that three days after his death on the cross, he will be raised from the dead. And John says that this Jesus is glorious. We have seen his glory. So what is so glorious about a baby becoming a man and a man dying a brutal, murderous, torturous death? It doesn't seem glorious. It seems tragic. So how is this glorious? Uh, Well, because that baby, he's the word, became flesh. In in other words, he is God with skin on. Uh, He is the God who saw our brokenness, who entered into our brokenness, who entered into the mess. But he didn't just enter into the mess. He actually took the mess on himself. He took the mess on himself when he went to the cross. He, He actually, on the cross, became the mess. He became our sin on the cross. He He actually became the brokenness of the world. And it was in that moment that God was glorified as sin and death were defeated. That's Christmas. That is Christmas. Uh, 
And in a year with so much uncertainty where everything is different and everything has changed and everything's been upended and everything is is all uh, just not the way we want it to be. All our plans have been changed. All our traditions have been put on hold. This message of Jesus's love and grace is needed more than ever. Friends, I want you to know that you are loved. You are more loved right now than you could possibly imagine. Regardless of what is happening all around you, regardless of how out of control the world looks, Jesus is real. His message is true and his love is for you. And nothing can stop that. Absolutely nothing. Not one thing can stop that. Now, John ends his biography of Jesus's life by saying this in chapter 20, verse 31. Uh, But these things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. John is saying that the reason I wrote this down is so that you could know who Jesus is. I want you to know who Jesus is. Uh, Listen, friends, what what I'm about to say is perhaps the most cliche thing that a preacher or pastor can say on, uh, on Christmas Eve in a Christmas Eve sermon. But do you know what would make the greatest Christmas gift? Knowing Jesus, believing in Jesus knowing that you are loved by him, knowing uh, that you can have your sins forgiven, knowing that your guilt, your shame, your mistakes, they could all be taken away and that you could have a relationship with the God of the universe and that he would grant you the gift of eternal life. So this Christmas, let us together, no matter where we are from, no matter what we believe, no matter what our story is, let's gather together around Jesus. Let's come to Jesus. Let's together, let's together believe, believe in Jesus, the one who made us, knows us, and loves us, and wants to have a relationship with us. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in this moment we can celebrate, we can celebrate perhaps the most cataclysmic, earth-shattering, history-altering moment where you entered into human history, where you said, I want to be known. Jesus, I pray that right now in this moment that all of us, all of us, anybody who's hearing this, that we would know you, that you would make yourself known to us. And that this Christmas, our hearts would be filled with peace, peace because we know you. We know that our eternity is secure. We know that our sins are forgiven. We know that we have been granted your grace and your peace. And we know that we are endlessly loved by you. Jesus, we thank you. It's in your good name we pray. Amen. Amen.
有雨。